Frederick Taylor is a founding father of organizational studies. His scientific management approach has surely touched many aspects of your professional life, as you will see. He was a mechanical engineer and a management consultant. That meant that he was an outside person that would come into organizations to try to help them make things better. Factories at the time were springing up everywhere and standardized ways didn't yet exist to manage large groups of people and handle increasingly complex work. So Taylor saw this need and he wanted to step in and make organizations more standardized, efficient, and productive by studying their work processes closely. Scientific management is the term he used. He did a lot of studies and wrote books about it. It's basically meant applying science to work, studying tasks carefully, systematically at the micro level to speed up work. He wanted to break away from the common sense rules of thumb that he saw as unproven and inefficient. So workers had their own self-styled ways of doing things that they would pass around. And he said, hey, there's really no way to know if this is the best way to do things, so let's study it. Scientific management is also known as Taylorism, which of course is named after him. Division of labor is a practice that he believed in. He wanted to divide work processes into very small, simple, and separate steps, division of labor. And that meant instead of doing a whole project where you did it from beginning to end, you would only do one or two little steps, and then the next task was performed by the next person. So this is a very different way to do work at the time. He wanted to determine the one best way, a standard, to do every part and every task to boost productivity. That's what he's really known for, looking for that one best way to solve the riddle. He also believed in hierarchy, he wanted a clear chain of command that separated all the employees at the bottom of the organization from all the managerial people toward the top. And the reason he wanted to do this was that he wanted the managers to design the work process and enforce how that work was performed. Employees, as a result, would just follow directions. They just became doers, and the managers were then the thinkers. He believed in selection and training and compensation in a way that was a little different at the time. He wanted to select and train high-performing workers or what he called first-class employees and then match them to a job that was best suited for them. He saw this as the ideal. And he believed that the most productive workers should be paid more. He thought on average that most employees were not very hard workers and he didn't have a very high opinion of employees. And he wanted to get rid of those people and if they couldn't meet the higher standard, he would fire them. And only the good people would be left. His method was called time and motion studies. That meant he wanted to figure out the least amount of time on average it took to perform each task and even each part of each task. He really broke it down. What were the fewest number of motions required for each small task? He wanted employees to basically work like they were machines. As I mentioned, he was a mechanical engineer by training and background. And so that's what they do. They design and build machines. And he wanted people to act like that. His shovel experiments were a great example of a time and motion study. And so the idea here is he said, hey, you know what? Instead of just using whatever shovel, why don't we figure out the exact amount of poundage a shovel should hold to make work the fastest? So he did experiments where he took 10 guys and he lined them up and gave them all a pile of sand or coal. And he said, I want you to take this shovel, which held about 26 pounds, and move your piles from here and about 10 feet over to there. And so they worked at it all day, and he kept track of everything with a clipboard and a timer. And at the end of the day, they went home. And then overnight, he cut off a little piece of metal off of each shovel so that it was about a pound lighter. In other words, it held about a pound less of coal or sand. And then they came back the next morning and the, he told the workers, okay, remember those piles that you moved? Now I want you to move them back to where they were in the first place, which was probably a little frustrating for the employees, but they were getting paid and so they did it. And he did this every night and kept taking a little bit off of the shovel until he saw the number peak. And every time they took a little bit off, the numbers went up. Then he noticed that he kept taking more and more off the shovel and then the numbers started to go down. They were actually finishing their piles 
later in the day each day on average. And so he said, oh, maybe we've passed the midpoint. So we went back to slightly larger shovels. And sure enough, the numbers went in the right direction again. And he settled on 21 and a half pounds. That was the perfect amount of sand or coal that you should fit in a shovel to move the most amount in a given day. So that amount meant you could move it faster because it was a little lighter. It also meant that you could take fewer trips. So if you're using a really small shovel, you'd have to use more motions, more trips to the pile. So he figured out the ideal amount of time and motion for shoveling. And that's why, by the way, if you go into any hardware store, you're gonna see all kinds of different shovels, shapes, and sizes. And this is all influenced by Frederick Taylor, his experiments, and his thinking, certainly by extension, after that. But it's not just shovels. You see this everywhere. Like today, in fact, if you go to a sub shop and order a sub, at the end of the line, they're going to ask you if you want anything on it, like mustard. And they pick up their dispenser, and they do about three swipes across to put that mustard on. And then they kind of look up at you like, oh, is that enough? And you decide whether or not you want more on there. There's a competitor, however, that has a nozzle with three spouts on it. And that means that they do one squeeze, one motion across, and now the mustard or the ketchup is done. And so they're saving two motions. They're saving just a couple seconds on that one little step, but they're able to make that sub a little faster. Now, if you break down the process of making a sub into 20 or 30 steps and you figure out a way to speed up each of those tiny little steps, how to cut the bread, how to put the meat on, how to put the lettuce on, how to cook it, etc. Now you can crank out more sandwiches per hour with fewer employees, more sandwiches per day total, and you're making your company more money. And it's not just subs. If you go into just about any fast food restaurant, especially the franchises, you're going to see that they have figured out a very quick method, the one best way to make almost every single product they make. If you're making one burger versus two burgers, for example, you don't make it the same way. You have to increase your productivity. So you see this just about everywhere. The guy who took this to the next level was Henry Ford. Of course, he's the founder of the Ford Motor Company. And it's still in existence today, still thriving today. When he first started making cars, the car stayed in one place. And they did a little bit of time in motion studies on it, but it still took them about 12 hours to make a car from start to finish. The workers were all working around the car. And then he said, hey, let's really go crazy with the time in motion studies. And then he said, let's also make an assembly line. He didn't invent the assembly line, as they say, but he did perfect it. And so they just kept studying the process as much as they could. And they took a car from 12 hours, which is what it took to make it at the beginning, all the way down to 93 minutes. They got it just right. They say at its fastest, there was a new car rolling off the end of that assembly line every 11 seconds. It's just incredible. Boeing recently changed over the way they made their 737s. They actually used to make it in one place like they originally did with the cars. And then they moved it into more assembly line style, which they call a lean production, where the plane rolls along with all the tools and even the workers inside just a few feet an hour until it's done. And from start to finish, they were able to almost triple their production rate. That's a lot of savings for the company and a lot of savings for the client. The outcomes of Taylor's work are mixed. On the plus side, he absolutely helps people boost productivity by 200, even 400% or more in some cases. So that's a big win. More work accomplished with fewer people meant more profit for the companies and a more consistent product of arguably higher quality. So let's say if you break something on your car, you can get an exact duplicate that fits in perfectly. You don't have to have a handmade piece, which would be incredibly expensive and not necessarily higher quality. On the other side of the coin, there are some outcomes that were not so great. Companies often failed to pay employees more. This is a central part of Taylor's advice. You have to pay people more because you want to hang on to the best people and you want to keep them motivated. And he recommended they do this. Ford took that advice and he paid people double the going rate at the time, which is one of the key reasons that Ford had such great people and thrived. Most companies, however, did not do that. Managers think employees do was a philosophy that became normal. 
separated workers from the greater meaning of work. So if they're only tightening a bolt or painting a screw, then they're not really connected to that broader satisfaction of making a whole product anymore. It de-skilled employees and made them expendable. You could find and replace somebody in just a few moments. You didn't really have a lot of skill or time invested in each person. Survival of the fittest philosophy really took over. That harsh atmosphere resulted where it was a very cruel and unfeeling atmosphere. Employee burnout, that dehumanization of being treated like a machine, and the mental anguish that came along with this mundane and repetitive work were all part of this experience. So Frederick Taylor, one of the founding fathers of organizational studies, has clearly influenced many aspects of our work today, and that's why we study him.